Module 14, Multiple Files. So far in our Excel training course, we've only ever had one Excel workbook open at a time. However, sometimes it is unavoidable to have two files open at once. This may be because we're importing raw data from another file, or it may be that we want to export data from our workbook into an output file. We have learnt how to refer to different cells within an Excel workbook. We've learnt how to refer to different sheets within an Excel workbook. But how do we refer to distinct files? So here is the problem. Here we have a text file which tells us the names of donors, how much money they've pledged, and whether they've paid or not. We want to automate getting data out of here into our spreadsheet in which we record unpaid pledges. Those are the pledges indicated by an N, meaning no. The first step to take is to open the file into Excel. We're going to record a macro to see how this is done. So now we select to open a file from the file menu. We look for all files. We locate our text file and open it. This is a delimited file with commas separating the fields. So if we select commas, we will find that everything lines up nicely. If we hit finish and then we hit stop, we have a second workbook. The first step is to make sure that we can open the file at the click of a button. So if we put a button in place and give it a fairly obvious title, we can then view the code for the button. Note that when we're in the Visual Basic window, we now have two spreadsheets. We have VBA project, example macro 14, which is the file we're in. And we also have module14.txt, which is the file we just opened. So if we look in modules, we can review the code we recorded. We can copy the code and paste it into place. The first thing we notice is that there is a lot of code associated with opening a file. If we try and penetrate the code, we can see that commas separate data and that other things don't. So if we delete the other things which don't separate data, we may find that the code becomes somewhat shorter. So at this stage, we can undertake a process of trial and error. We can very simply see if the code still opens the file. At the moment, it does. Let's try getting rid of the trailing minus numbers because that doesn't seem to do anything either. Once again, no damage has been done. Let's get rid of the field info and the origin and the text qualifier and consecutive delimiter. And we can even get rid of tab. The file still opens. And in fact, we can also get rid of start row, which leaves us with some code which almost fits comfortably onto one line. The next problem is that we have referred specifically to the file location on the computer. Were the text file to be in a different location, we would be unable to open it. In an ideal world, upon clicking import data, we would get the same options for picking files as if we click open from the Excel file menu. The good news is we can actually get that by writing the following code, application.file dialog and then we get a variety of options. We can either have a file picker, a folder picker, or we can open a file or save a file as. Now, in this case, we want to pick a file. But as we wish to use the property, we have to write with at the start and then end with at the end. Now, this notation is just something you will have to refer back to and remember. Now we are referring to the file dialog, we can show it. And once it's been shown, we can remember which item we selected. So the input file would be dot selected items one. That means the first item which has been selected. So now if we run the program at dot show, we get the option of selecting a file. We then select one. Input file is equal to dot selected items, which if we look at the properties window has the same value as the file name which we had to use when opening the file. So we can replace the text string here with input file and now we open input file. We can now introduce safeguards so to ensure a file has been selected we should say if the count of selected items equals one then input file is the selected item. 
Again, this passage of code is a useful one to remember. We might then say that at the start, input file equals zero. And if input file still equals zero, after we're supposed to have picked a file, then go to exit sub. So hopefully by now, we've managed to open our file successfully. Now it's always useful at this stage to have a check to check that the file which has been opened is of the correct format to continue. So we should say if active sheet, which will always be the sheet open on the workbook you've just opened, if active sheet dot cells one one, that's a one, is not equal to name, then we can't process this file. So what we say is active workbook dot close. Then in brackets we indicate when we close a file whether we wish to save the changes. If you are importing raw data, you should never want to save the changes, so we say false. It can also be indicated as save changes equals false. We would of course then go to exit sub. We could also give the user a message to say file is of invalid format. If I click the button and try to open the wrong file, I get a message file is of invalid format, click OK, and nothing's happened. I've now reopened module 14 so we can see what kind of data we're extracting. Very simply, we want to see if there is an N in column C, and if there is an N, we want to copy columns A and B into the relevant table. This means we will need to define a header row, we will also need to define a name call and an amount call. When planning to deal with multiple files, it is always easiest to extract definition data whilst there is still only one file open. So right at the top of our macro, we're going to make header equals range header row dot row. We're going to make name call equals range name call dot column and amount call equals to amount call dot column. So if we refer back to our text file, we want to cycle through every row of data until we get to a blank row. So we want to start with row two. So very simply, we're going to start a do while loop. Do while cells x1 isn't blank and loop. So do while things in column A aren't blank. But the problem at this stage is that cells x1 could refer to anything. In fact, because we're writing the code within sheet calc, it refers to sheet calc. So instead of referring to sheet calc, we need to refer to the sheet that is open. So that would be active sheet. At the end of our loop, we want to increment the rows by one to ensure we cycle through them. So the next line of code would say, if there's an n in column C, then we want to copy the data across. The data we want to copy across is what's in column 1 and also what's in column 2. Of course we want to put the data in columns B and C underneath the header on our unpaid pledges sheet. So how do we do that? Well we can refer to this workbook. This workbook is always the workbook in which we're writing the code and we want to put in cells, I'll call it CUR row, meaning the current row, in name call and also we want to put the data in CUR row amount call. How do we define CUR row? Well CUR row starts off equaling header plus one and each time we add a new row of data CUR row equals CUR row plus one. Now if we stop the macro we can try to run it from the start. The problem identified immediately is that we've referred to some cells within a workbook. Now the workbook may have many sheets, so as well as referring to cells, when we refer to a specific workbook, we need to refer to the sheet that the cells are in. So we can do this by after this workbook putting sheets, and then the best way of writing the sheet's name is to write its code name, which you can find on the left hand side, and put dot name, then dot cells C-U-R-O. So in a nutshell, we've told the code to copy data from the active sheet, which will be the import file, to this workbook, this sheet, and in the cells where we want the data. So let's try running the macro again. 
Now you may want to step through the macro to check it's working. We can see it's not working and that's because there's actually a space before the ends in our file. We can mitigate against the space by using the trim command. This means any spaces around active sheet cells x3 will be removed from the data. That means if the cells contain space n, they will be considered as having the entry n. So now, apparently, we've entered data in our original workbook. We can't check whether we've entered data in our original workbook without clicking on it. So we can see we've entered the name Edward in our workbook. Now, if we press F8 again, we will get an unpleasant surprise. The amount is equal to Edward. You may wonder why that is. That's because we're copying the amount off the active sheet. We have interfered in which sheet is active. If we go back to module 14 and rerun that line of code, we now have the correct amount entered in the spreadsheet. So each and every time you check the file while stepping through your macros, you have to make sure that you leave the same active sheet at the end of your checks as was the active sheet at the start. So now we can play the macro again. We've now reached the end of our loop. But instead of leaving the file open, which we have open, we should say activeworkbook.close, that closes the import file. And don't save changes in case we've done something nasty. So if that is the last line of code to run, we're then just left with our own file. So the macro now works, although we haven't imported all the data because we were messing around with the code whilst running through the macro. So if we try re-importing, all the data gets imported instantaneously and we've successfully imported data into our file.